Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are broadcasting from the Thomas K. McKeon Center for Creativity, and I'm your host, Corey D. Taylor. My guest today is Michael Whitaker. He is a tech CEO as well as an author, and the book he's authored is The Decision Makeover. If you want to know what it takes to make good decisions, you've come to the right place. So stay tuned because this is Up Close with Corey Taylor. Hello and welcome back, and I am joined today by Mike Whitaker, tech CEO as well as author. How are you, sir? Good morning. Good. You doing good? Good, good. Man, well, I'm glad you're here. I, look, I told you he was going to come out the box swinging, man. Well, we're here to talk about some amazing things, but one of the things we're going to be talking about is your new book, The Decision Makeover. But before we get to that, tell me, what have you been up to lately? Launching that book. This week was a big week. We launched September 12th. It's been great watching the Amazon numbers go up. Got the reviews going. Uh, a lot of publicity. I got a few articles uh, in uh, Fast Company and, and Money Magazine. and So it's been good. Been exciting. Man, that's exciting because but not, not only have you launched the book, but you've also started launching these podcasts where you've been talking to different people and they'll a caller will call in and pretty much you're like a business doctor. You're diagnosing yeah. what's going on in their life. So I, I, I want to say this, this is so fast, but out the gate, I was sitting one day driving out of town and I was like, oh, Mike, I, I connected with you on LinkedIn. Yeah. And I'm like, Mike got a podcast. It's talking about like first impressions. And then this guy, I guess he had a thriving business at one time, but he got so caught up in day to day that he started letting himself go in appearance. Like he had started yeah, becoming right. overweight and everything. That's right. And then after he told you all about that, told you about that, you started going in and diagnosing like, what type of effect this really have on us? So for a minute, you know, talk to me about that because people think that with the way society is now, that first impression really doesn't matter anymore. But on the contrary, it does. Yeah, that particular caller and for that particular podcast, we focus on one specific decision that's affecting someone's life, you know. And, okay. and in this case, um, when we don't get the results we want, we can go back to a decision we made and ask ourselves, well, what did we decide? And did we decide correctly, right? So this fellow had decided to not worry about his first impression. But over time, and, and he was in sales. He had, oh. And so over time, <laughs> you know, your first impression really matters. The effects are exponential. They add up, right? So uh, that was his point was he said, I can't just decide to be thin again. And, I, and my podcast response was uh, the decision makeover process, which is outlined in my book, it takes you through linking your daily and monthly and yearly decisions to your long-term goals. And when we do that, those are anchor points, and we actually pull ourselves toward what we want to get in this life. And that's what that whole book's about. So that caller jumped right into uh, something that was very important to him, which was business success. And you can't get that if you don't make good decisions and all the main factors that will affect your success. Now, you, I've been knowing you for some years, and you're a pretty deep guy because, you know, we met because our children went to the same school. Oh. But I remember that you were a numbers guy. Like, you knew statistical information. <laughs> and I heard someone say this. They said, you can say a lot of things, but the numbers don't lie. And I noticed that in your book, The Decision Makeover, you have statistical information breaking down that, yeah, you can say if I, you know, gain an extra 20 pounds, it's not going to affect me. But the actual data supports, um, yeah, it will affect you. That's right. That's right. That is, is really clear that uh, men with muscles get paid more. I saw that. And women. Boom. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yes, I get, get to the gym. But uh, but women but women um, you know every pound a woman gains uh, she loses money in income opportunity, the facts are there and so uh, I don't get judgmental in the book I'm just giving people information about these decisions we make affect what we get out of this life and uh, those there's a lot of biggie categories you know um, appearance and, and income are, are and what we do for a living that's just one category but there are there's a dozen categories and wow decisions. and you know and what's so awesome is because. You know, we're we're in a culture now where everybody talk about body shaming and all of this. But that's what I was liking about the statistics in your book. And you just hit it on point. You was like, look, I'm not here to judge you. 
Here's what the numbers say. Right. I didn't create these numbers. I just watched these events that created these sort of anomalies of patho pathological type results. Right. Right. And now I'm just telling you what they are. Now, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. But again, it goes back to the decision. So five years from now, if you make the wrong decision, whether it's not working out or health or something right. like that, you're going to be able to go back and tie it back to a decision you made. When I started reading the book, I said, oh, he got me. <laughs> I said, he got me. I said, um, I, I, you hear about looking back at the decisions, but what would you tell a person, man, when they realize that they like, I should have did that. I should have did that. I should have did that. I should have did And then they start as becoming this heavy thing. How do they get past of the self-loathing of I made all of the wrong decisions to get to making the de right, right decisions. Well, now. regret is a fascinating subject for me because regret it only happens once you know you made a bad decision. Until you don't know that for sure, it's kind of like my wife says, I should have ordered what you ordered. She only, <laughs> she only knows that after she tastes what I ordered. Exactly. And so it confirms it for her. But regret is heavy. It's like luggage. And uh, regret comes from bad decisions. At whatever point you are when you read my book for the first time, all the time prior to that, you just shove to the past and you learn from it. And the book starts you off fresh. That's what the word makeover in the title, the decision makeover is about. The word makeover means we're going to do better at this point forward. Good. So what we do is we, we start a new process of decision making. So what does a person do? Well, first thing you do is become more aware that a decision is in front of you and it has some big impact in your future. You know, there's small decisions, what we wear today, what we eat, what we, you know, what movie we see. That's, that's okay. Have fun with that. But the medium and the big decisions, the book outlines, you, you approach those a little differently. Just what I did, uh, I went looking for why people are successful. I mean, there's the root of the book. Um, and I think everyone wants to be successful. Now, it's important that that's a personal definition. And we can talk about that. But successful people make decisions differently. And that's what I was able to figure out. And I looked at the data and I interviewed people. And uh, there are flukes, there are people that get lucky, right? But, right? but for the most of us, we get what we decide. And the longer we go, the bigger the consequences or dividends, depending on which way it went okay. in our lives. So successful people make decisions differently, and both the first time and when, they, when it goes bad, they make decisions differently. And so, now that, man, that's some good stuff. But since you went down that road about decisions can either, good decisions can impact dividends or not, or bad decisions can do the same thing. When I was perusing your LinkedIn account, you had one title up there that said something like, I remember when I lost $15 million. I, I, I said, I was at the computer like, er, $15 million? Like most people can't even fathom in their mind. But what was that all about? Yeah, I debated with my uh, my uh, social media expert whether or not even to let that out, out because I try to be, I'm very humble about it and I lost it. I didn't gain it. That's the important thing there. I had it and lost it. And, the, and what happened was, in one of the biggie decision categories in my book outline is who we partner with in this life is one of the biggest decisions we make, both in marriage or also in business. And uh, at the time, I had a good business and I merged with a bigger business and I had partners. Wow. And what cost me, we really grew the business and we were really this close to, uh, we had it signed up to sell. But I had partners who had ultimate control. And as I wrote in the book, in hindsight, you know, if you're in a partnership, quote unquote, but they can ruin the business and you have nothing to say about it, you can't affect it, that's not a real partnership. Wow. And uh, that's a lesson learned. A lot of entrepreneurs get in that boat when they try to ramp up the business or they try to sell and exit the business. Uh, but truly, a partnership is a huge decision and it costs me dearly. Now, in hindsight, that was, five, that was six, seven years ago. But in hindsight, what I figured out was um, success for me was not financial, wasn't mon about money. And I think everyone needs to think about their own personal definition of success. But what we do to make decisions in life to get to success that we define I think it's more than money, and I, and I want people to understand that. It's about, a, I think, a balance of what you love, what you do, what you get to experience, the world you get to take in, uh, where you travel, um, what you get to build, um, and all those things combined, success is, in my view, a balance of those things that fills your heart and your mind. 
that's the decision makeover, to go get those things that we want. Because if you just can't keep score financially, uh, I know a lot of people that have money, they're very unhappy. Right, correct. So I wanted to give people, as, as the subtitle says, you know, an in, a, intentional approach to getting the life you want. Well, let's take that approach. Let's do the decision makeover and let's make decisions in a better way with a process that it's easy to understand. And that's what the book delivers. Now, I want to say something because sometimes I'm at the precipice of life and I have to make a decision. And <clears throat> there are there are decisions you know it has multiple paths sometimes mm -hmm. and knowing which path to take and so you like you said you only realize that you made a bad decision most of the time in hindsight or once you initially pulled the trigger mm -hmm. case in point i was doing a real estate investment deal one time and i got to the table i was stand. i was going to make like nineteen thousand dollars off of it i was like yo it's good to go but i got to the table i just had this bad feeling like don't sign these papers i even get up go into i mean go outside call my wife in a whole nother state and say i'm getting bad feelings about this i shouldn't do this my wife said go back in there push the papers back walk away from the deal I go back in, I'm, I said, okay, I'm finna push the papers back and I'm finna walk mm -hmm. away from the deal. The person who had brought me to the table who was like a new business partner, they was like, wow, you got us all the way to this and now you finna back out on the deal. So they put pressure on me. So if you were coaching someone, because I know that I'm not the only one to get into those situations where they started right, dancing right. the whole time, but right. now they realize that we're getting ready to go into the party. I don't want to dance with you. How do you tell them to get out of that situation? It's a great point you make is that we're not always in the best decision-making environment to make a clear-headed decision. I, there's a character in my book called the decisionator. Okay. And the decisionator is you and me at our worst. It's when our mind is not right to make a good decision. Now, here are the things that create the decisionator. And this is, we can detect when we're in this mode, we can pause, which your wife's very smart, and you know that. Right. Um, she is. Yeah, but the, the traits of a decisionator are being hurried, being angry, being tired, being feeling rejected, uh, feeling um, uh, overwhelmed or stressed, anxious. Um, what these are, are anything that are, makes our brain reach for what feels good, not what's necessarily the best decision. Okay. So the decisionator simply wants to get something done to feel better immediately. Like, like how good does ice cream taste at midnight? Wow. That's a decisionator decision because I'm tired, and my brain wants that hit of you know that feel good. Endorphins, yeah, they that want feel good, yeah, right? Right. But it's not in my bigger long-term plan. It's not hitting my goal of health goal, for example, but the decisionator interjects all the time. It's, um, it, it's when we're weaker, and, the, and she's right. One of the antidotes is, uh, to the decisionator is to pause, push back, say, can I sleep on this? Can I get back to you tomorrow? And such. Now, to answer your question, I have three lifelines that I propose in the book. The first thing is you ask yourself between the two options, which one of these gets me closer to my goal, my big goal? I ask you to name your top goals so you can anchor yourself to your future. Okay. So if it That's isn't tough. obvious, it's like a destination on your, on your map, a map on your phone. Do I care if you turn left or right? Not really, until I know your destination. Then one of those turns, once I know your destination, right. takes you closer and one takes you further away. So the first lifeline is linked to your goal. Now let's say you can't figure out if that really, either one affects your goal more positively or negatively. The next lifeline is to make a list of the consequences. And the way I look at this is option A has certain consequences and option B has different consequences. And I look at those lists and I ask myself, which group of consequences can I most live with? Because that creates less regret. If I choose that, I will never regret choosing it because the list was obvious. Mm -hmm. Now let's say that that is hard to do and you can't. The third lifeline is kind of like the TV show Phone a Friend. Right. Uh, it's called, I call it decision triangulation where you got three inputs, your own instincts, someone you love, and someone you respect but doesn't, isn't related to you. Right. Those three opinions, you and two other people, will triangulate like a GPS coordinate at, for accuracy. You will make the best decision possible. Wow. That's the three lifelines. That's power. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Mike Whitaker spitting out this stuff, man. That's some good stuff right there. I, I know you're a humble guy, but, it. But, but, but that's so powerful because, you know, everybody wants to be 
rich because that's what they equate to success. And there was this movement and I'm not going to blast those books, but I read a lot of those books. Mm. And when you read them, it's just a bunch of rhetoric. It's just a bunch of jargon with no real solutions, you know. But one of the guys that I like that talks about finances is a Dave Ramsey. Oh, yeah. He talks yeah, and he sure. gets to the meat and potatoes. He, he, here's the plan. Here's it is. That's what I liked about your book. It has some practical stuff that can be implemented that can actually get you making good decisions today. Not right. Right, right, right. Two days from now. Well, look, we only start where we start in life. Each of us starts at a different point, and it's what we do from there as we go through life. We're how far we get, and where we're headed is really up to us, and that's a little scary sometimes. Yes, about, it is. Wow, I'm in charge of all this, right? <laughs> right, right. And so people, when they realize that this is my life, and I, what are your goals? And they, their eyes will glaze over. Well, I guess I do have goals. You start thinking about what their top goals are, then once they realize these are achievable in incremental decision making. That's what the book walks you through. You will get to those goals. You will achieve them, but it's one decision at a time. And you can't have too many goals because what you have too many, none of them really get accomplished. So that's the thing is avoid being the decisionator. Be aware of good decisions that are right in front of you and link them to your goals and you will achieve them. Okay. So in your book, in chapter eight, you talk about we can do better. Okay personal exercises, my greatest dividends and decisions that got me to get there. Mm -hmm. What is that chapter about? Well, first of all, be aware that what good decisions have got you already. Okay. Okay. You know, you married well, I married well. Right. That was a fantastic decision. Um, those are dividends keep coming. You know, those dividends, they bring you joy. They, they help they help my career I think probably help your career a whole lot uh, they they bring you a whole lot of comfort and joy and and you know the dividends of a good partnership they keep coming so one of the things to recognize is everyone has made good decisions but they usually are only their own critic they aren't thinking about what they've done well those things okay. keep paying off but chapter eight's about we can do better because you take inventory of what's worked and then look at what else you have you desire to accomplish with your life and realize the makeover can start today. So, so we can do better means now that you're aware of what that book's talking about, you can, well, just by focusing a little bit more on your goals, you can get your decision making to steer you and you'll make progress and get a momentum. And that's one of the things the book talks about is what momentum feels like in life. Things aren't hitting you and knocking you back. Good decisions create a momentum and it's called, I call it a decision streak. Yeah. So that's what we want. Now, now I want to ask this question because far too many times, even with me, I talked about how I get up to the point where mm -hmm. it's go right or left, but I may not always choose the right direction. L let's go to the place where once a person has made the decision and realize that that decision that they made, they took a wrong turn. Okay. We know that, but now we in the hole. How do we, change and go the opposite direction because you know we got guilt we got all kind of disappointment and everything and we feel like we're just stuck down and out and and then tell me that but then give us a personal story how you actually changed that trajectory and reversed it well first thing about the successful people study i did is that successful people when things go bad a decision blows up and they realize it's a bad decision let's say an entrepreneur hires the wrong person business people do this all the time um well, they have two reactions to a bad decision. One is to fail fast, the other is to fix fast. There's no other options. Oh wow! Failing fast means, listen, you know that feeling you know when you're dating the wrong person, or right. that feeling where you've hired the wrong. Failing fast means I'm calling it. That's it. That's enough time and money spent. I'm going to stop this. I'm not waiting. So many people wait and sit on decisions they know they need to make, that they don't make them. They don't fail fast. So successful people fail fast, or they fix fast. The fix fast means you change the deal renew contracts, restructure the workload, change the partnership. It's not about trying harder. You should already be trying hard. Right. But that's what successful people do is they fail fast or fix fast once they realize they made it and then they move on. So they don't waste time and money and resources and such. So uh, for me, um, in business, most often the time, I'm, I'm failing fast in a marketing approach I've taken. I'm like, I'm not going to keep throwing money at something when I realize i got have plenty of data to know they're not responding or a bad hire. I say, look, you just need to be either another position for this person or I made a bad decision. I'm sorry. We need to go our own separate ways. Right. Um, but uh, 
failing fast is a humble thing and fixing fast is an aggressive get things right thing. But um, waiting, I find that most people say, I, I just can't make a decision. There's so many people that are afraid of that. But successful people are not, they, they, they may not like it, but it's like eating your vegetables. Right. You do it. Right. Wait, I got I got to I, Look, you just read my mind because I was getting ready to say, if you got to make a decision, some of my problem has been I get right there. The doors I want open are opened. It's good but I will procrastinate on making the final decision. Sometimes I've waited and made the decision and it, and I still got what I wanted. But sometimes I've waited a little bit longer than I should have and now that door closed. How do you take help a person get past that procrastination of actually making a decision? Well, the reason you're delaying is you're looking for more data. Okay. You're looking for more obvious signs of what you should do. Part of that is hope. Hope's a bad thing when it comes to decision making. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hope is a bad thing when Hope it comes to decision thing. making? Absolutely. Okay, go ahead, because I want to hear this. Hope is a bridge we build because we're very human. I hope the best in every situation, even when it's going bad. The problem is hope doesn't do anything. It actually does not, it's not a decision. Hope is a feeling. But the people use hope. Let's say, let's say for example, you, uh, you hire the first person off the street to fill a job. You didn't do your diligence. You didn't research this person and the fit for the job necessarily. Or you buy a used car and you don't really walk it around and test drive it. You have hope filling the gap in these decisions. Hope is something that we do to fill gaps of uncertainty. Wow. The problem is, is that it often fails and it doesn't help the decision making at all. I don't mind being optimistic. We can all be optimistic, but I think hope is a very bad thing um, because it's kind of like... Uh, uh, jumping into a partnership without knowing the partner, mm -hmm. the only thing holding that thing together is hope. Right. And that is a very false foundation because as we all know, the reality comes. Hope only lasts so long and then the reality hits and you're left with what you're left with. So what I'm hearing you say is, let's take decision making out of this whole mystical approach that so many people use. Like I remember like spin the bottle or I'm just gonna throw some grass up in the sky and if it blow to the right or left that, you know what I'm saying? You're saying, mm -hmm. let's take all of that out because there is definitely science, data research that brings direct correlations with helping to make decisions. Yeah, I think for, for simple decisions that don't aren't big impacts to our life, we can throw grass, we can flip coins and have fun with it, right? right? <laughs> well, where are we eating tonight? Let's flip a coin, I don't mind that. Right. But when it comes to stuff that you want to really happen in your life, you have to take the decision a little more seriously. And I, what I'm saying is, is that if we will recognize that the decisions have a bigger role in our life than we think, and, and they're all linked to get you over time what you want, they all add up. But we'll recognize those things. Let's just be aware and think about how we link our goals to each one that we come across. That's, that's all we're saying. We don't have to do anything fancy. The book walks through a process, but uh, you know, if you're looking at the consequences and you look at the opportunities and you can weigh those things, uh, you're doing better decision-making than most people. And that right. you'll get more than what you want in life. Wow, now, if I, if I may, Mike, I have to go back here because you know, 2008, um, a lot of people were losing like so much money. Um, I, I knew financial investors, like people that had been millionaires for years, but like throwing their money into the market and then they lose, fa they lost 15 million in one day, 14 million in one day, something mm -hmm. like that. They was losing sure. astronomical numbers. Sure. Some of those people didn't make it back mentally, emotionally. When you went through what you went through, how, how, how did you get back? You know, how, how, did, how does one recover from something like that? Now, I'm going to say, I know your wife, and you said we married good. We did make good decisions. Sure. My wife has been, I couldn't even be doing what I'm doing with the show without her. She's sure. been my consummate support for everything. And I know your wife is being understanding with whatever you're going through. But how did you personally, in this realm of decisions, how did you get back from that? Yeah, not fast. Not fast. I mean, uh, you take these hits in life, and I think the bigger goals you set, the bigger the hits could be, right? If you set big goals, you could fall far. Um, what I realize is that I really enjoy, as an entrepreneur, building things. Okay. I like building ideas. I like building people, build, building concepts. But I think, how do you get out of the, 
the failure, the cycle of self, you know, ridicule, the woulda, shoulda, coulda thinking. I had to set my sights on something I wanted more in the future than, than I wanted to stay in my past and kick myself. That's powerful. Right? So you find that thing in the future that you really want and it takes your mind off focusing because our mind, if you don't tell it what you want, your mind will stay on what it knows. Right. And it knows you just failed. So you have to say, no, but I want this. And now it has something to focus on that's positive. So wow. what I wanted to do was go build another tech company. I wanted to write this book. I wanted to make sure my kids knew what I th knew about decision making and some concepts I've been studying for 20 years about success. I had some things I wanted to say. So, you know, that's how I did it. A combination of things that I wanted more than to sit there and, and discuss and think about what I had failed to do. Man, I want to tell you that already I've started reading it and, and it's going to make me now I want to hasten to read it now even more. <laughs> but I like this cover, this art, and we're going to put a picture of this up. But this is beautiful. I like this the way it's laid out. And whoever did this or who, you or whoever, that was great. There is a main door there with a light, but the other doors you can go. So that's the illuminated door. That's what decisions do is here's the decision you need to make. And that thing you said about the triangle, that was awesome. Now, this show, Up Close with Corey Taylor, is all about helping people to go on and know what it would take to be successful in life. And you've already said that's what people have to make a self-definition of what that mm -hmm. really is. Sure. But in your own opinion, in about 20 seconds, what do you think it takes for a person to be successful in life? I think you look at the things that you enjoy. Joy is the key word. I have, you know, what do you find joy in? We have joy in work, we have joy in family, joy in relationships, in romance, uh, in hobbies. And the important thing, I think, is to find a little of your joys in all those areas that, that make you you. That's what makes your personal uh, feeling and satisfaction that you say, I live the life the way I wanted to. Wow. That's the freedom, I think, is the ultimate thing. Freedom to enjoy what fills your heart. And that's, to me, that's what success is. Well, Mike Whitaker, man, thank, thank you, you so for much having for having yeah, me. No it. problem. I hope you've enjoyed our show today. I would like to thank our amazing guest, Mike Whitaker, for joining us. Think about this. Change is inevitable, but your attitude towards that change, it is always optional. Until next time, keep looking forward.